Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus again. Today I am Trace, and this is episode three of three on gravity. Subscribe so you get all the episodes in this series. Check us out on SoundCloud, iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts to make sure you get the audio version of this podcast. It's squished all together, all the different things. It's great. Do that. Also leave us a rating. So, so far, we've established gravity is everywhere and that it is so weak that a baby can defy it, but it's so strong and important that without it, we would all die and the universe would cease to exist as we know it. Gravity is awesome. But that's all kind of blasé, right? Gravity, pfft. What about the crazy stuff? When I was in eighth grade, we went to Cedar Point, the greatest roller coaster park that I have ever heard of. This was a science trip. I know, it's the best. We brought homemade, or really made in class, G-force measuring devices with us, and we were tasked to ride and measure the gravity on each of the rides that we went on. We were measuring G-forces which is a, quote, form of acceleration that causes the accelerating object to experience a force acting in the opposite direction of the acceleration. Gravitational forces. And according to the Bioastronautics Data Book from NASA, 1973, the authors wrote, quote, a few units of measurement have been more misused and misunderstood than the unit G. Because G does not represent gravity. Instead, what it actually represents, what gravitational forces actually are, are acceleration forces, apparent forces because gravity exists, not actual gravitational measurements. What it does is it tells how much force is acting upon you due to gravity. So think of the force of gravity as one G, you know, one G force. If you feel twice the force of gravity, that would be two G, 18 times 18 Gs. If you feel no gravity, that would be zero G, and that would actually be really rare if not impossible. But you feel that swooping feeling in your stomach? That's an airplane, you know, dropping suddenly or going over a hill on a bump? That's less than one G. There's no such thing as negative Gs, literally less than zero Gs. That's not possible, because that would mean gravity was pushing the other way on you. That's not a thing. That's yet. <laughs> We know the tolerances on humans because we put people in acceleration sleds, centrifugal chambers, and so on. On roller coasters, fighter jets, and rockets, we see the experiences that they have, and we can measure those g-forces. And there are a lot of them, and they can be pretty dangerous because they act on everything. For example, a few years back, I flew in an F-18. It was awesome. I threw up everywhere. But I had a pressure suit on that would squeeze my legs and my abdomen when I would fly into positive G forces. So if I went six or eight positive Gs, it would force the liquid in my body down into my legs. So the pressure suit would squeeze my legs and abdomen so that that fluid would stay up in my head and upper body to keep the blood in my brain so that I didn't pass out. Pilots and astronauts have to deal with these forces all the time. And they're actually tested to see how many g-forces they're experiencing and how many they can stand. Apollo astronauts were put through a lot because we'd never gone to the moon before. We didn't know what we would expect when we got out there. I went to a lecture by John Glenn and Michael Collins at the Smithsonian in DC, and they talked about EIEO tests, which sounds super technical, but it actually means eyeballs in, eyeballs out. It's a centrifuge chair in a chamber. So it spins really, really fast, and it could flip directions. So you'd be going really high g-forces in one direction, pushing into your chest, say. Then it would flip really fast, and the g-forces would be pulling outward, away from your chest. So eyeballs in, <laughs> eyeballs out. And there was a lot of concern about all these g-forces. See, in the early 20th century, we thought there was an upper limit to how many g's the human body could take. We'd set that limit at 18. 18 Gs. The reason being, there was a lot of airplane crashes, and during airplane crashes, they would go look at the wreckage, and they would say, oh my gosh, this pilot pulled 18 Gs. That explains it. And they kept seeing this again and again. So they assumed that people had passed out or they died because of all these G-forces. But a biophysicist named John Stapp, he wanted to know what the maximum human Gs actually were. So he built a rocket sled, and he strapped himself into it, and he would shoot himself at increasing speeds to get those g-forces. Turns out the human body can survive 46.2 g's, maybe more, but that's the peak that he went to. He was still alive after that. He was hurt, but he wasn't dead. So we can experience a lot without too much trouble. 
we'll be hurt, but we'll be alive. G-forces are really interesting because you can also use them to do other things, like fly. Parabolic flight, or the vomit comet that maybe you've heard of, is where a plane flies and does a dive and then pulls up and then does another dive and then pulls up. And each dive lasts a dozen seconds or so, maybe more. And the idea is you can test free fall or zero G, microgravity space environments, and you can do it without having to send anybody to space. You just put them on an airplane. A lot of YouTubers have been doing this lately. You probably saw the movie Apollo 13. Parts of that were filmed using this technique. This zero G flight is really just free fall. The same thing as jumping out of an airplane with a parachute, but you're doing it inside of the airplane. But what it does do is it helps teach us about microgravity. This episode of Seeker Plus is brought to you by Lego Technic. Whatever you build for, whoever you want to be, Lego Technic is the real deal. These sets are more than just bricks. They're real life builds with moving parts and realistic models, real working gears, electric motors, even pneumatics. It's taking the kits that I used as a kid to the next level. Go to lego.com slash technic to find your next Lego Technic build and see how Lego recently built a life-sized, drivable supercar out of Technic parts. That's lego.com slash technic, T-E-C-H-N-I-C, Lego Technic, build for real. So, okay, so let's revisit this microgravity we were just talking about. In space, microgravity is serious stuff. The reason that we take an airplane and we put it in parabolic flight, the reason we test all of the astronauts with all of these different G-forces because Microgravity is serious business. It's not zero gravity again, microgravity, because gravity keeps things in orbit. You're basically just falling when you're in space. They're going so fast that they never hit the ground. The Earth just falls away below them as the space shuttle is flying by. Super fun, but also can be bad for the human body. Because humans and life, we didn't evolve to live without gravity. And we'd like to think, you know, science fiction would like to tell us that we can just go out into space and it's not gonna be a big problem. But without gravity, we don't know what's gonna happen, especially our gravity, specifically. When you're in space, they call it flying. You're floating, you're in free fall, so you're just flying around. You're not using your muscles. There's nothing drawing you toward the ground. It sounds freeing, but it actually can be bad for the human body. What happens to astronauts on long-term travel is a loss of muscle mass, a loss of strength and endurance, you can get kidney stones, bone loss, weakening of the body, and weakening of the bones. And we adapt, the human body, it adapts to survive. You can go into space and you can work out, try and mitigate this, just like on the ground, you work out and you gain muscle, you live somewhere in a high altitude, you adapt to it. If it's hot, you know, so on and so forth. But the body's adaptation for gravity is, we don't need all this bone and muscle. The body is very efficient. If it doesn't have to maintain all of that, why does it? Why would it? That's adapting. That is how adaptation works. And this could be the reason that we humans don't space travel. If we can't be in space for long periods without getting weak and wasting away, we're never going to get to Wally, -E, Star Trek, you know, you name it, because there'd be so much bone loss. Also, Wally, -E, come on, those guys in the chair and they've had all this bone loss and they just hop out on the earth and start farming? No way, never could happen. <laughs> the thing is, you can simulate gravity when you're in orbit. A genius sci-fi writer, physicist, one of my favorite authors, Arthur C. Clarke, he wrote 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was published in 1968. In that, he had a spinning satellite that had, quote, artificial gravity. The thing is, it's not actually gravity. It's simulated gravity. When the station spins in this sci-fi book, the centrifugal force acts to pull the inhabitants toward the outside of the station. The act of the station having walls and stopping them is what simulates the gravity. It's Newton's laws of motion again. Forces have equal and opposite reactions. So you can simulate gravity, but it's not actually gravity. Nothing can create gravity except lots and lots of mass. You can experience this gravity simulation if you go to the amusement park and you get in the spinning spaceship ride, the Gravitron. Uh, it's a spinning thing, you know, it's great. Can't lift up your arms, whatever. That's basically what this is doing, but in space. They use this in a lot of different sci-fi. One of my favorite shows, Babylon 5, used this. They put public transit in the little gravity area and everybody lived on the inside of this giant station that was spinning to simulate gravity. 
The idea being that way people could live in space. Also, Babylon 5 is great and I should rewatch it. Just mental note. But we can't make gravity without mass. Unless, maybe, if we figure out the graviton. In 2016, a mathematician, not a physicist, mind you, had a hypothesis using math, not experiments or testing, that we might be able to manipulate and create gravitational fields. Artificial gravity, maybe? Maybe, 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 maybe. Not ones that would hold people down in a spacecraft, of course, just ones to study the gravitational effect on space-time. Because basically, like gravity, electromagnetism, one of the other four fundamental forces, curves space-time. It just does it way, way less. So using a really large superconducting magnet, we could study the curving of space-time because gravity is curving space-time. The thing is, we can't escape gravity. So we can't study our gravitational effect on space-time because we're surrounded by it all the time. So if we can use magnets, then hopefully we can study gravity and learn even more about it so that someday, far, far in the future, we can figure out how to manipulate it. Math, I guess. So throughout this whole series on gravity, I've been talking around this thing that we don't fully understand it, right? That doesn't make it less fascinating, does it? We didn't think so. If we could somehow impart lots of mass to something, then we could make gravity. But then we'd have all these other problems, like using huge amounts of fuel to move that thing around, and the inertia would be intense. But if we could figure out the graviton, maybe we wouldn't have to impart a huge amount of mass. Before we discovered the electron, we couldn't have imagined harnessing electricity, right? Before we discovered the proton and the neutron, we couldn't have imagined harnessing the power of the atom. And we're new at doing that. So maybe in a thousand years, if we've figured out the graviton, creating gravity won't be no thing. We'll have to wait and see. In the end, gravity. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. Maybe it says more about the power of this weak force in nature than we originally thought. What do you think? Thanks for watching this episode of Seeker Plus. Come back for more. Make sure you subscribe so you get all the episodes in this and all of our future series. If you want to come find us on Twitter and Facebook, you can do that by looking for Seeker. You can find me by looking for Trace Dominguez. And we'll see you next time.